Hi, in this module, we're going to look at how we can work with SharePoint content in a SharePoint framework component. And specifically, we're going to look at using the SharePoint REST API. In this first section, we're going to focus on what the SharePoint framework or what the SharePoint REST API is, and then how the SharePoint framework REST API uh, is provided to us in order to use the data from SharePoint REST APIs inside of a SharePoint Framework component using the SP HTTP client. And we're also going to talk about how to read data from SharePoint lists. The SharePoint REST API is the primary API for accessing data in a SharePoint uh, site remotely. This is going to be available to us in both client-side and server-side solutions, client-side being SharePoint Framework components and server-side being locations that are living off the SharePoint server, such as in Azure or on my laptop. There are many SDKs and libraries that leverage the SharePoint REST API, including the SharePoint client-side object model and PMPJS are two such examples. You're going to be able to perform CRUD queue operations, that's create, read, update, delete, and query operations on SharePoint entities, including items in lists and libraries. The SharePoint REST API is going to conform to the OData v3 and v4 protocol specification. Now, the way you access the SharePoint REST API from off the server is that you must include an authorization header in the HTTP header request that contains an OAuth bearer token. Or when you're on the SharePoint server, as in the case of a SharePoint framework component, the because you're already on the server and you're already logged in, you're going to have cookies on your machine that will be included with every single request. And what that's going to do is that's going to give us access to the uh, SharePoint REST API and it's auto we're automatically going to be authenticated with the cookie-based authentication. Now there are other headers that are used to control how the REST API is being used. We can specify if we want OData v3, which is the default for the REST API, or we can override that and say we're interested only in working with v4. We can also control the amount and the type of metadata that is returned and the type of operations that we want to perform, as in the case of updates, where we want to may want to merge data and deletes. And we'll see how we can do that in a later section. And then finally, we can also tell the SharePoint REST API how it should handle conflicting versions that I'm trying to update. This is an example of what an OData query looks like. And it's going to show how we can use these things called query operators. And these are indicated on the URL parameters with the dollar uh, prefix. So dollar select, filter, order by, and top as some examples here. We can see the SharePoint REST API. At the top, we're going to a SharePoint site. And then the second line is the actual REST API, where we're saying underscore API slash web slash lists slash get by title. And then we're going to tell it the name of the list we want to touch. And then that we want to go to the collection of items within that list. And then we have these four different parameters. We've got select, filter, order by, and top. And they work very similar to relational uh, database um, uh, queries like in T-SQL, where select is limiting the amount of columns we get back, filter is like a where clause, order by is um, going to give us the different um, uh, uh, sorting options, and top is going to limit the amount of data that we get back. Now. The SharePoint framework is going to implement calls to the SharePoint REST API using the SP HTTP client. This is derived from the out of the box API, the HTTP client API object. It adds some additional stuff to our request uh, for us on our behalf. Like it's going to tell the SharePoint REST API we want to work with OData v4 and we want minimal metadata to be returned. We can always overrule those if we want to or override those settings. There are two methods on this object that we can take advantage of that are derived from the fetch API. It's the get method and the post method. The post method is going to be used for doing various things, such as updates, deletes, and creates. Now, how do we read data from a SharePoint REST API and using the SharePoint framework? Well, the first line that you see up there in the constant endpoint that I'm creating, that's the endpoint that I'm going to be submitting to the REST API. It's going to say where we want to go and what we want to do. So you can see here, I'm going to the current SharePoint site, and then I'm using the REST API to get a reference to the collection of items in the countries list. I'm saying, give me all the countries back, but I only want to get the two fields ID and title. Now I'm going to execute this by saying SP HTTP client dot get, and I have to pass two parameters in. I pass in the endpoint and I pass in the configuration. 
The nice thing about the configuration is that you're always gonna use this value because at the time of the recording, this is the only option you have available to you. This is how we're setting the O data to O data V4, and it's how we're also setting uh, the minimal metadata. I have a third option that I could use here for the request object if I needed to change the headers or if I wanted to add a body to it. And that's usually gonna be most useful when we're doing uh, any of the right operations. Now, the next thing that we're gonna end up doing is that we're gonna issue the request and we're gonna get a response object back. So when you get that response object back, that's going to give you access to the uh, HTTP response headers and status code and things like that. But we don't have access to the actual raw data, or at least we do, but it's all coming back in a byte array. So there's a method called JSON that's going to take that byte array and it's going to read it in and convert it to a JSON object. And that's going to return back yet another promise that we can then handle. And we know that because we went to the items collection, we we're going to get back a collection of results. Even if it's an empty collection, we're still going to be getting back a collection. So I know that that's going to be in the value property, and that's going to give me back an array of items. In my case, I've created an interface called iCountryListItem that has two properties, ID and title, that matches the data type that I'm going to be getting back. So let's take a look at a demo at how we can read from the SharePoint REST API using the SP HTTP client. In this demo, we're going to see how we can get data from a SharePoint list using the SP HTTP client uh, library. And this is going to give us access to the SharePoint REST API, uh, which is going to give us information in a SharePoint list. So what I have here is a SharePoint site. And in this site, I have a single list and it's a list of countries. So if I look at this list of countries, you can see here it's just got a list of a handful of countries that are all uh, listed out here. And what I would like to do is I'd like to show you how we can actually how we can get data from this list using the SharePoint HTTP client. So what I've done is I've created a web part. We'll look at the code for this in just a moment. But when I click on Get Countries, this should pull use the SharePoint REST API to show me all the data from this SharePoint list, and that's exactly what it's doing. So how's the code for this work? If I come over here into Visual Studio Code, I've already got the project uh, already open. And what this is, is a React-based web part. So I've built a web part here. If I scroll down, you can see that in my render method, my React web part is the SPFX content web part, and it has two properties on it. It's got a uh, SP list items, which is gonna be a list of all the countries. And then it's also got a uh, function so that when I click this button of on get list items, it should trigger this method right here of on get list items. All right, so when this thing first loads, we have no items that are gonna be set. And then when I click the button, this event will get raised, which will call this function. That's a little bit farther down right here on the get list items. We'll look at that in just a minute. What that, well, I can look at it now. What it does is that it's gonna call another function called get list items internal. Uh, and when it gets the response, it'll set that to the country's property, as you see right here, which will trigger a re-render. And then this will render out all of those properties. And you can look at that, uh, if you like, you can look at that at the, um, the React uh, component. You can see how those are rendered out. But there's nothing special here. We're focusing on the SharePoint client and getting data from the SharePoint REST API. So what I've done is you see up here at the top, I've added a reference to the SharePoint HTTP client in the SP HTTP uh, package. If I scroll down here inside that function on the get list items, what I'm doing here is I'm calling the this context.sp HTTP client. That's where my HTTP client is going to be accessible from the context object. And then I call a get. Now from that get, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, let's set the, the URL that we want to be able to the endpoint of the SharePoint REST API. And so I'm going to look at the current SharePoint site that I'm in by going pagecontext.web.absoluteurl and then pass the URL in. And that URL is going to point to the REST API, the web slash list endpoint, I'm gonna get a specific list, and then I'm gonna say, go get all the items in that list, and specifically just get the two fields, ID and title. And here's where you can see my V1, uh, the V1 configuration, as we talked about in the slides. This V1 configuration is what tells the SharePoint REST API that we wanna use the OData V4 protocol, that we wanna use minimal mo metadata uh, to come back, and a couple other configuration things that all of our projects are going to end up wanting. 
then what we're gonna do is I'm gonna get the response back by saying, uh, get the response back object back and I'm gonna go parse the response body as JSON by calling the, jo the dot JSON function. That will return me back a JSON object. And I know that that object that's coming back has a value property that is an array of items. And so I'm gonna say, take that value property back and return that back to the caller, which is of type I country list item. Now this is an interface that I created, which is just has an ID and a title property on it. And the reason I created it like this is because I know that when I told it, uh, told the SharePoint REST API is I only wanted to get an object back with those two properties on it. So once I did that and I have those values back from the, from the get list items, he returned that back as part of the caller. He'd be able to show those values as you see right here, get list items, it's returning back the response. That response is an array of those items. So when I set that back and then re-render the web part, I'll get my list of all my items. And so in this demo, you saw how we were able to use the SharePoint HTTP client to issue a GET request uh, from the SharePoint REST API. In this second section of working with SharePoint content in the SharePoint framework, we're gonna see what's involved in doing the create, read, update, and delete operations. And specifically, we're gonna focus on the write operation. So creating, updating, and deleting. You're gonna use the SharePoint Frameworks, uh, SP HTTP Clients API. Specifically, you're gonna use the post method to write to the SharePoint REST API. Now, some of the operations that you're gonna perform may require additional HTTP headers, like if match and ic, the X HTTP method, which I'll talk about more in this section. Um, sometimes they're required, sometimes they're optional and just something else that you could add to your request. Um, some other operations for spe specifically the create operation will require you to ad include additional data in the payloads body, such as the odata.type property, which we'll look at in just a minute. Now, when you create list items with the SharePoint REST API, you need to tell the SharePoint REST API what kind of data that you're creating and that you're submitting in your payload. Now, this is due to the fact that a SharePoint list can contain multiple content types, and thus I could have multiple fields. Some are used in, a, in one list. Some would be used for one content type. The other, some would be used for a different content type. And some may be required and some may not be required. And so depending on the item that you're creating, it may be required for you to fill data in or not. And you have to tell SharePoint what scenario we're in. Now, the way that you can take, you, you can address this is by finding out what kind of data is supported and then when you submit the request to SharePoint, you're going to tell it what kind of data that you are going to be um, submitting. So for example, you have the property called list item entity type full name property that you can use. So let me show you how you can use this. On this slide here, I'm first, I'm going to create, uh, I'm creating an, an item, but we have two methods we're going to use. And this is the first method. The first one's called the get item entity type. So what this one does is it's going to return or resolve a promise uh, to a string value. And so what I'm doing is, is I'm going to the countries list again, and I'm using, I'm not going to his item collection. Instead, I'm just going straight to the list and saying, I want to get a specific property called list item entity type full name. So I'm going to issue an HTTP get, just like we did in the last section. And it's going to give me back the JSON response. But I know there's only one property that's on that response. It's the list item entity type full name property that I'm interested in. Now I'm gonna use that. So here I'm going to call the this.getItemEntityType uh, method that we just saw on the previous slide. And that's gonna return back the entity type. So I know that's a string and I'm gonna stuff that into the SPEntityType object on my first then that you see there. So I'm gonna use that to create a new object that I wanna to send to the SharePoint REST API. So I'm gonna do that by creating a request object and I'm gonna set his body property equal to the stringified version of a JSON object, and that JSON object is just gonna have two properties. The first property is gonna be the title property. I'm just gonna give it some random string. And then I'm gonna set the OData type property equal to the SP entity type that we got back from the previous call. Now, in order to go through and to create the object, if you're gonna jump down to the bottom here, what you'll see is I'm issuing an HTTP post, and I'm using the post method, to a specific endpoint, which is gonna be the collection of items for this list. I'm setting the same configuration as we've seen in other requests. 
And then I'm gonna pass that request object as that third and optional last parameter. When I wanna update items, there's two things I need to pay attention to. I should specify the type of the operation I wanna perform because by default in a, in a normal HTTP request, you can submit a verb or use the verb called merge. And what that will do is that will say, I only want to update the items uh, or I only want to update the, the columns or the properties of the item that I'm specifying. Anything I don't specify for this item, leave it alone. If I use the, the post method though, instead, what that will do is that will say, I'm going to update all the items on the thing or all the properties on the item that you're specifying. And if you happen to not specify uh, a property in your payload, well, I'm just going to assume that you wanted to null that out. So the merge method says, don't only address the properties that I'm submitting, ignore the ones that I'm not submitting. And so what we have to do, the, the challenge that we have though with this, especially with the, the fetch API is that fetch only has a post method. And so what I have to do is I have to, I have to have a special way of telling the SharePoint framework or the SharePoint REST API, how exactly I want to uh, update uh, an item. And I do that by setting the X HTTP method and I'm gonna set his value to merge. So that's kind of like a, a way of bypassing the post method. I'm saying I'm still using the post method, but when it gets to the REST API, treat it like a merge. Now, the other thing that I have to do or that I should do is specify the version of the item that I wanna update. Because let's say for example, that I open up a page and it's got a, uh, a SharePoint list item on it. And I'm sitting there for five to 10 minutes and I'm going to, I want to make some changes to it, but by the time I submit my changes, it's actually after the fact of someone else has gone in and made an update to the item. So I think I'm updating version number four, but they're really updating, I'm really updating version number five. So I, I'd be overriding the previous person's changes. Now, the way that I, the way that we address that is in with SharePoint uh, and, and with OData, there's a property called an e-tag. And what that e-tag is, is a version number or it's kind of like a unique version ID for that specific item. Now this has absolutely nothing to do with versioning, uh, major dot minor versioning on a SharePoint list. This has something to do just with the raw API. So regardless of what versioning setting you have on a list, what I'm about to tell you is 100% is the case all the time. Um, every time you add an item or update an item in a SharePoint list, it's always gonna have a version number applied to it. And then that version number will be incremented by one every time that there's an update. What I can tell the SharePoint framework or tell the SharePoint REST API is that when you go to update the item, the item that you're updating should match a specific version that I'm expecting it to match. So if I'm updating version four, I'm gonna include as an HTTP header, an if match header that says you should match version four. And if you don't, the SharePoint REST API will return back a 419 uh, error that essentially is saying you're updating an, al a, an item that's been that is newer than what you think it is. You should go make it. You should go refresh and resubmit your update for version for another version or newer version. So how do we do that? Well, here in the code, what I'm doing is I'm first going to go get ref a reference to a specific item. So let's just call that list item right here. So I'm then going to go update that item. So I'm going to change his title to USA. And then I'm gonna to go to save it. Now to do that, I'm gonna create a request object. And in the headers, I'm gonna set the X method equal to merge. And I'm also gonna set the if match equal to the list items odata.etag property. And I'm casting it as an any because my interface for the iCountry list item doesn't have this property listed on it. So I'm just going to a generic object and saying, I'm expecting this to be there. I'm then gonna set the body of the item that I wanna update equal to a stringified version of this list item that we're working with that we just updated up here. So here I'm then gonna, I'm gonna save my changes by having the endpoint point to the items collection and specifically in parentheses, the ID of the item in question. And then I'm gonna just issue a post to that endpoint with this configuration and this request. And this request is gonna have the body of the object that I wanna update with these new headers. Now a delete is very similar to an update in the sense that we don't have a delete HTTP verb that we can use with the fetch API, even though it is a supported verb, uh, HTTP verb with the SharePoint REST API. So what I'm gonna end up doing is again, I'm gonna have to kind of trick it and say, when you get this post, treat it like a delete because I'm gonna use, I'm gonna set delete to the X HTTP method. And the same thing is true with that if match header, except it's probably gonna be the case that when you go to delete an item, 
you don't really care what the version number is. So you can say, I want to do an if match equals a star. So how do we do that? Well, again, I'm going to go get a reference to an item, such as this list item right here. And I'm just going to say the X method is delete and the if match is a star. And then everything else is the exact same as it would be for an update. Best way to see this is an action in a demo. So let's jump over to the demo and take a look at how we can do uh, creating, updating, and deleting items with the SharePoint REST API. In this second demo, we're going to take what we learned in the previous demo and where we learned how to use a HTTP GET to get data from a SharePoint list. We're going to see how we can also write to that list. This involves adding, updating, and deleting list items. So if I come over here, we'll take a look at it. Again, if I look at my list of countries, we can see that I have United States as an option and the last option is Chile. So if I come down and I say, add a list item, if I click on this, I should get a new list item that gets added. So add a list item also got a new a, a reference to all the items. And you can see here, we've added a new item with a timestamp and we can confirm that. If I come back over here to my site, you can see that there it is or my list. I actually have this timestamp, it was just added. So we have a timestamp that was added, that's one. The next thing I'd like to do is show you how to update an item. The item that's gonna get updated is United States. We're gonna change the name of this to USA. And sure enough, if I come back over here to my list of countries, I can see that the title has changed to USA. And then finally, my delete list item should delete this last item that's a timestamp. So if I come back up here and click delete list item, and then scroll down, we can see that it's gone. And sure enough in the list, it's gone. So how do we do this? So let's go back to our, our web part. And this is the same web part we looked at in the last demo, except we've just added in some additional functionality on it. We now have a couple things here. So in my render method, I have a couple other buttons that I've added, add button, update button, and a delete button. And so when I click any of these buttons, they're all gonna basically do the same thing, which is the add list item will add a button, then it will get all the items and then update the UI. Update does the same thing, calls an update method, and then gets all the list items and updates the UI, and delete will do the same. So let's look at the code for each one of these and see how they work. So we've already seen get list items. That was in our previous demo. Now, the first thing we, we looked at was how to create an item. Now, when you create an item in a SharePoint list, you have to tell the SharePoint REST API what kind of an item you're creating. And we went through this in the slides. Uh, but if you remember from the from our lecture in the previous section, the challenge that we need is that lists can have that we need to address is that lists can have different kinds of data stored inside of them. So I can have one list can actually have multiple content types assigned to it, and each of those content types can have different rules and requirements. So I need to figure out a way to do that. So what I've done is I have. Um, uh, I'm first making a call to the using the SharePoint REST API, the get, a GET request for the country's list, but I'm looking at a specific property on that list called the list item entity type full name. So when I get that back, I'm gonna return that back as a string back to the caller. Now I can create an item. So here in creating an item, what I'm doing here is I'm saying, go take that, that type that was actually returned back to us, and I'm gonna create a new request object. So I'm gonna say create a request object and his body property is gonna be equal to the stringified version of, an, of a JSON object that has a title property of the current timestamp and is gonna have an additional property called the at odata.type property that is gonna be the value of that data type. So here, once that's done, if I scroll down a little bit farther, I can see that now I'm issuing an HTTP post and this time, the first parameter, I'm pointing to the items collection. That's where I'm going to create an item. Then I'm going to set the configuration to V1, but I'm going to add in some additional data by passing in this request object. That request object has a body object that's going to write out the item. So that's how we add an item. Now, how do we update an item? So what I'm going to do is two things here in the updating. I'm first going to go get an item. Then I'm going to change a value in it. And then I'm going to update it. So the first step is to go get that item. So I'm gonna do that here. And you can see the only difference in the, uh, in the query here that I'm doing on my get is I've added in a dollar filter operator to say filter for the where the title equals United States. 
once that's done, scroll back to where I was. So once I have the United States object, which I get right here and I hand that back. So here's my, here's that list item that I have. That's now the United States object. I'm going to change the title of this to USA. Now, if you recall from the lecture and the previous section, we also have two other headers. I don't, I'm not going to go, uh, potentially, I don't want to update all of the other fields in this item. I simply want to update the title field. Now, in our case, we actually have access to all those fields because that's the thing that we got back, right? So we, or actually here, we only have two. We have the ID field and the title field. If there were other fields on this item, I don't want to null those out. I want to merge them. And so what I would do is I would use, create another request object and change his headers value to have a XHP method equal to merge. And that's going to just say only update the fields that I'm sending you that are updatable. The next thing I'm doing is here on the if match. And this is saying only match it when the E tag matches a specific value or the version number matches a specific value. Then I'm going to do the same thing we did when we created it. I'm simply going to say, take the request body, stringify the object that we just created, and then issue an HTTP post. But this time, notice I'm doing it not just to the collection of items, but I'm doing it to the collection of items with a specific ID. Now, the last thing to look at here is the delete. This one's really straightforward because all we're doing with the delete is we're going to figure out which item we want to delete. So here I'm going to run this query here. Similar query that we, that we ran earlier where I was just saying I want to do a select statement, except I'm saying sort them by the ID field in descending order. And that's basically saying take the list of items and flip the order of them in descending order and then just grab the first one that you at the top of the list. And what that's doing is, is that's giving me the last item that's in the list. So say grab everything, sort it in descending order and get the first item back. That's really saying grab the last item in the list. That's the one that we created with the timestamp. So once I have a reference to that right here, I'm simply going to say with the headers, I don't that I need, I want the delete or the method that I want to run is the delete method. And if match is simply saying, I only want the, um, uh, I, I don't care what the version number is. Go ahead and delete anything that's there. And then to delete, I issue a post. And then this piece right here, I'm just saying, go to the items and delete the items. Now, the one thing that you see here in the code about setting this request body here on the list item, I don't need to do that. I could just issue the, the items here because this post, I don't need to have the body in the actual um, object that I'm sending back. So this was really not necessary. So in this demo, you saw how we could write to a SharePoint list using the REST API by way of the SharePoint HTTP client. In this last section, we're going to look at using mocks to simulate SharePoint data when working with a SharePoint framework component. Now, the challenge that we're going to have is that when we are running in a SharePoint live environment, a SharePoint REST API is going to work just fine. But when we're not in a SharePoint live environment, such as the local workbench, it's not going to work. We need to be able to have tested data because SharePoint REST API doesn't exist on the local workbench. The SharePoint API doesn't work on the local workbench because there's no real SharePoint context. There's no SharePoint server that's running. The SharePoint workbench is just a HTML page with a mocked up version of the SharePoint framework in a web part page that we can use to test our web parts. So testing web parts that use the SharePoint framework REST API, they're going to fail on the workbench, on the local workbench. So the solution is, or one solution is, that when you're in the local workbench, detect it and use simulated data instead of live data. So how can you do that? Using the environment and the environment type objects. These are available to us in the SharePoint Framework API to determine the current environment. So here I've created a property called is SharePoint. And what that's going to do is return back a Boolean value. This is going to check to see are we currently is the current environment type equal to SharePoint, which is modern page or classic SharePoint, which is a classic page. If either of these things are true, then I know that I'm in a real SharePoint environment. There's another option for the environment type to look to see if I'm in the local workbench, but we really don't care to see that. I'm just looking to see, am I in a live environment? And if I am, use real data. Otherwise, don't. So here's a way that I'm actually using it. You'll see this in the demo in just a minute. I've got a method here called onGetListItems, and his job is to, is to check to see if I'm in a live environment or a test environment. And if I'm in that test environment, let's use some mocked up data. So the if statement says, if I'm not 
if this is not is SharePoint, so meaning I'm in a I'm in a non-live real SharePoint environment, then I'm going to set the country's property to a some static data uh, from in an array. Otherwise, I'm going to use the get list items method, and what that's going to do is that's going to actually call the SharePoint REST API and set the countries to the value that I get back from the response. Let's see how this works by using mock data to simulate real SharePoint data. In this last demo, we want to look at how we can work with mock data or how we can detect if we're in a live SharePoint environment or if we're in a production SharePoint environment because we don't want to try and get production data if we're working inside of a um, the local workbench because the local workbench doesn't have context around SharePoint lists and the SharePoint REST API. So right now you can see I'm in my hosted workbench that you see up here inside of a SharePoint online site. And when I click, I'll click on get countries, I'm getting real data back, all right? Now that's all fine and good, but what happens if I go to the local workbench? I would still like to be able to click on get countries to see this thing work, but I should be getting mock data back instead, not be throwing any errors. Or well, when I click these other buttons, I shouldn't see any errors. So how do I do this? Well, if I come over here in the code and I look at the web part itself, We've already seen how to get live data. Now the next trick is how do I detect? Am I in a real SharePoint environment or am I in a test local workbench environment without SharePoint context? A lot of that's gonna be handled right here inside of this uh, environment and environment type um, objects that are returned back to me as part of the API and the SP core library package. So what I'm gonna do is if I scroll down and if I look at this new function that I've created here and it's called the is SharePoint or underscore is SharePoint. It really is just a property. Now what this is doing, it's gonna return back a Boolean value. So if it detects that the current environment is SharePoint or if it detects the current environment is classic SharePoint. So the first one here that you see, that is SharePoint Online. The second one is in a modern page. The second one is I'm in a classic SharePoint environment. Either one is a valid SharePoint site. So if I'm saying if I'm in either one of those, then this is SharePoint. Otherwise, it's not. And so the method we were using before of on get items, I check to see if this is not SharePoint. If it's not SharePoint, or if it is, it jumps down to the else statement and it runs the code that we've looked at so far in the other demos inside of this, uh, this module. But if it is not SharePoint, then I don't call any of my code that's gonna go to use the SharePoint REST API and instead, I'm gonna use the this dot underscore countries and what that does then instead is that will create some dummy information and bind that to my page. So this way I'm able to detect, am I in the local workbench? And if so, don't use the SharePoint uh, API to call the SharePoint REST API. Uh, and then the other side is, uh, no, you are in a SharePoint live environment, you can use the REST API. And so that's where I do that down here. It's a really simple um, uh, solution, a really simple scenario here of one that you may want to look at doing to, to be able to implement it for your custom projects. And with that, that's everything I wanted to show you in this last and final demo of this module. In this module, we saw how to work with SharePoint data and SharePoint framework. Specifically, we saw how to, how to read data using the SharePoint REST API and the SP HTTP client and then in the second section, we saw how to write data using create, update, and delete operations and what the different nuances associated with those. Finally, in the third section, we saw how we could work with simulated data when we were working in the, in the local workbench to create like a mocked experience. I've also included a handful of resources here that you could take a look at that are related to this topic. So feel free to dive in, take a look at this, learn some more, and I hope that you actually got something out of this module and learning how to work with the SharePoint REST API and the SharePoint framework. Thank you very much.